Hello, this is J.P. Salibi for the Priority Health Academy, and this is for all the enrollees. This will be one of the uh, chief topics uh, for you to review, so hopefully uh, you'll enjoy this presentation. So sit back and enjoy um, and stop and pause as you need to uh, to um, take a deeper look at the slides. As this presentation is given before different groups and other practitioners um, in accordance to some things that need to be done for CMEs, I will include my disclosures. So I have no relationships with any kind of commercial pharmaceutical uh, interests. And uh, I do sit on the advisory board for the nonprofit LDN Research Trust as one of their medical advisors. I'm a founder and director of the Priority Health Academy and um, the Carolina Holistic Medicine Centers. So I really don't have any kind of conflict of interest to disclose here. The objectives for this lecture will be a little bit about history of hypothyroidism and uh, some timelines, so it gives you some perspective. Um, we'll also uh, talk about glandular versus cellular hypothyroidism. This is something that's probably gonna be a little bit novel to you as it's not usually discussed in other lectures. And we'll also talk about allostasis and how this is related to thyroid disorders and how to best diagnose hypothyroidism. Uh, the tests that we'll discuss will both diagnose uh, euthyroid conditions, hyper and hypothyroidism. But we're gonna focus on the low functioning thyroid for this lecture. We'll talk about the role of advanced thyroid tests and the role of reverse T3. How to best manage thyroid replacement therapy with both lab tests and some other modalities and diagnostics. Then it is uh, not all about thyroid. So when we kind of put the blinders on and think, oh, thyroid, 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 we, we wanna make sure that we're not missing other things. So that'll be discussed as well. Um, also, we will talk about dosing and delivery systems and herbal support. And of course, since this is not a live uh, presentation, we will not have a Q&A section. We are all very aware of the culture of medicine and uh, how that can have a negative impact on practitioners and patients. Uh, there's a, a, a new book out called Uncaring by a physician from Yale, who's a plastic surgeon who wrote about the culture of medicine. But part of this is seen time and time again with Dr. Gall, with Dr. Semmelweis, with infectious disease back in Vienna in the 1800s. And we see it now with the emergence of functional medicine and uh, often conventional uh, practitioners are calling the forward thinking integrative and functional medicine practitioners quacks. So that's a badge we can wear with honor because at some point uh, when the world catches up to us, uh, they'll realize that that designation was uh, improper. But this is a great cartoon that uh, has been in a number of presentations. And it's uh, a bunch of uh, doctors, conventional doctors, standing around the bedside of a patient who's kind of looking kind of startled. And uh, they're telling him that, uh, well, we can't figure it out. Mind if we call in a quack? And, uh, and that's where we come into play um, to try to solve root cause problems. I won't necessarily read all these slides. I purposely made them a little text intensive so that you can pause the presentation and actually read through all of this. But uh, in 2014, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists have estimated uh, that there are quite a number of Americans that suffer from thyroid disorders, uh, about 27 million, and it's probably much more now as six to seven years later. 12% uh, of U.S. population uh, with thyroid conditions, 200,000 new cases each year. 80% of them are women. So the women uh, are um, outweighing men uh, at a higher rate. Um, so it is kind of gender specific. Um, 
And it, it, unfortunately, 60% of people with thyroid conditions are really not aware of it. Um, it goes undiagnosed for many years. Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune disease of the thyroid, is responsible for much of the hypothyroidism in this country, uh, whereas in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, let's say, where iodine is deficient, that will usually be the number one cause. And there's some other statistics you can read here. Uh, there's also a rise of thyroid cancer. That could be a number of reasons. Uh, radiation, ionizing radiation exposure, chemicals, estrogen disruptors, a number of environmental things, gen genetic things, but also overdiagnosis. Um, I'm a firm believer that uh, the number of increased incidence of thyroid cancers are maybe a little overdiagnosed. Uh, they will not hurt the patient. The patient will likely die of some other reason uh, other than the thyroid cancer. So we have to be careful about overdiagnosing and then overtreating. Let's talk a little bit about the timeline of thyroid disorders or hypothyroidism. Back in the day, prior to Dr. Gull being involved in the uh, early to mid 1800s, hypothyroidism was actually thought of as a psychiatric illness. Uh, since it affects more women than men, it was considered like possibly a hysterical disorder and such. Dr. Gull was a very brilliant uh, surgeon and physician in England, uh, so much so he was knighted, of course. And um, he realized early on that the disorder of thyroid was more of an organic than a psych psychiatric illness. Uh, he is also credited with coining the term anorexia nervosa. So he took care of quite a number of uh, mental uh, illness uh, patients. And back then, they didn't have really specialties of psychiatric medicine. I mean, you're a generalist. You took care of everything. Uh, he was such a brilliant uh, physician that at one point, he was accused of being Jack the Ripper. Uh, because of his surgical skill and because they thought that uh, the Ripper was someone with a deep medical background and knowledge of anatomy. But anyway, he was exonerated after they dived into um, his, uh, his past and uh, made sure he, he was okay and not, um, not Jack the Ripper. Um, we'll fast forward to 1912 when uh, Dr. Hashimoto, Hakuru Hashimoto, published a paper on a thyroid disorder that he believed to be autoimmune. Now in uh, Japan, they eat a lot of seafood and a lot of kelp and there is a higher intake of iodine. And when you have Hashimoto's, you have to be careful with high doses or high intake of iodine because you can get flares. So he was seeing a lot of female patients with very swollen, tender thyroid glands and um, researched it and did publish a paper in 19. 12. And hence the name Hashimoto is attributed to him for that discovery. We'll fast forward into the mid, uh, early to mid 1900s, where we have Dr. Broda Barnes, a brilliant endocrinologist who looked at other means of diagnosing uh, thyroid disorders without using laboratory tests. Remember, this is the birth of those sort of things. So they were actually looking at lipids and lipid abnormalities to help diagnose before the advent of some of the more specialized things like free T3 and T3, T4 and TSH. And that work was kind of continued on um, because uh, Dr. Broda Barnes published some things in the 1950s and uh, it was uh, kind of revisited by Dr. E. Dennis Wilson, a functional medicine physician um, later on in the uh, 90s. And Dr. Wilson, as of this recording, is still alive and kicking, and I know him pretty well. We've had some exchanges in person and email. And then the present, we have functional medicine doctors who are following a new paradigm. We look at the HPA axis, and we uh, look at personalized medicine, uh, integrative approach. Um, we have a very specialized testing and non-laboratory testing to help make a diagnosis um, and um, look at thyroid function a little bit uh, more carefully. 
we can talk about the thyroid replacement therapy history. Uh, so back before Dr. Gull was even involved uh, too fully, uh, there were a couple of Portuguese doctors, uh, and this was very little known and hard to find reference, um, but uh, since it's more European-centric, um, some of the research from Portugal and Spain were not really uh, mentioned much because most of it was being conducted in England, the United Kingdom, uh, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and Germany. Those kind of focal points. But two uh, Portuguese doctors were experimenting by placing a portion of a goat's thyroid gland under the skin of a hypothyroid woman, and it helped improve her condition. Of course, we don't like to do that now, but we are returning to sort of an era of pellets therapy. But uh, prior to 1955, natural desiccated thyroid was the mainstay of therapy. When Synthroid was created and patented, it is a synthetic T4 only that came to market in 1955 and then was adapted in the 1980s as the mainstay. So the manufacturers of Synthroid uh, went on a great marketing campaign to convince most doctors to give up the practice of prescribing NDT or natural desiccated thyroid for the new and better levothyroxine. So it was more of a marketing campaign and politics within the drug industry and not really good science. So Synthroid was actually not even FDA approved. It kind of came in on the coattails of NDT and it wasn't until later that the FDA required them to do their studies uh, like with unithyroid uh, uh, to um, show efficacy and safety. And now we're seeing at the present a pendulum swinging to the other side. Uh, researchers, researchers have shown and bringing to light that natural desiccated thyroid or at least a combination of T3 and T4 instead of T4 only therapy better treats hypothyroid individuals. So there's uh, much more improvement uh, with the use of combinations or even T3 versus T4 only for treatment. So this is a more expanded timeline of uh, historical events and treatment options and trends. And I'm not gonna sit and go through all this because it's a pretty complicated slide. Probably could spend 20 minutes on it. But at this point, if you wanna pause the um, recording and kind of take a peek at this, you're certainly welcome to. So to put things in perspective about pharmacological uh, drug therapies in the world, uh, you know, levothyroxine was at one time ranked number one, but from a 2017 thir uh, survey, it's ranked third in the world in numbers of prescriptions written. The first and second go to lisinopril, which, um, you know, 104 million prescriptions written in that year. Uh, very close behind that, was another 104 million prescriptions of atorvastatin. And then uh, the fourth highest prescribed drug in the, on the planet at that time was metformin. But, you know, Levo has dominated the prescription writing uh, worldwide for, for many years um, because of the sheer number of folks with hypothyroidism. And uh, folks looking at levothyroxine, which is Synthroid or T4 only therapy, as the gold standard for that. So it's important to understand that thyroid hormones allow the body to function normally, metabolically, that is. Thyroid's main function is to oversee the patient's metabolism. So when you have low functioning thyroid, you have low metabolism rates, you tend to be colder, sluggish, all right? Hypothyroidism puts the body at a disequilibrium, as does hyperthyroidism. So we wanna correct this as best we can, naturally, if at all possible. 
In this slide, we have a pretty extensive list of the signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism. Again, I could read this through and I might pick out a few that I want to focus on, but depression is one. Very often, we see postpartum depression uh, is a misdiagnosis when, in fact, it is a postpartum uh, hypothyroidism disorder, sometimes Hashimoto's autoimmune, um, and it does happen within weeks to months after uh, delivery of a baby in many women. And so please, definitely, before you place a woman on antidepressants for uh, what is con considered a postpartum depression, please ha do a thorough check of their thyroid function. Weight gain is another main complaint or chief complaint of those with hypothyroidism, as is constipation. There is a higher risk of gallstones. You can see headaches or migraines, brittle, ridged, striated, or thickened nails, both fingernails and toenails, rough, coarse, and dry skin, hair loss. Uh, oftentimes, hair loss is blamed, uh, I mean, thyroid hypothyroidism is blamed for uh, hair loss bigger than it should be. I mean, there's other things for which hair loss can be blamed, but um, it seems like hypothyroidism takes a major hit. But, you know, there are other things. I just want people to know that it's not always the thyroid. Menstrual and fertility irregularities, fluid retention, the kind of puffy face, swollen eyelids, puffy shins, myxedema, which is what it's called, um, is a sign of that as well. Poor circulation, congestive heart failure, coronary disease, arrhythmias. Uh, especially with hyperthyroidism, you can get AFib. Um, there is also keratosis uh, around the elbows, slow speech, impaired cognition and concentration, anxiety, panic attacks, mood disorders, muscle and joint pains and weakness, low heart rate and low blood pressure, morning stiffness, low libido and erectile dysfunction in men. Cold intolerance is a biggie. People always complain of cold hands and feet, or they're always turning the heat up when everyone else is comfortable in the room. Um, the fat pads can uh, be a little enlarged above the clavicles. Uh, there's poor night vision also associated. Insomnia, fatigue, uh, we talked about the low body temperature, hoarse or huskiness of the voice, or fullness around the neck, flat facial expressions, and um, there can be a yellow, yellowness of the skin due to the inability to convert beta carotene to vitamin A, although I haven't really seen too much of that. Carpal tunnel syndrome, yes, I've seen that quite a bit. Sleep apnea, endometriosis, osteoporosis, hypercholesterolemia. So in the old days, they looked at lipid panels to determine and manage thyroid disorders. PMS, hyperinsulinemia, fibrocystic breast disease, and that's usually a consequence of low iodine. Iodine can help remedy that situation. Nutritional imbalances, the Bs, the vitamin D, iron, magnesium, Paresthesias, mixed edema we talked about already, a downturned mouth or a kind of a frown, allergies, hyporeflexia, especially the patellar and Achilles tendon reflexes are blunted, and that's kind of a very common sign. I test that on almost every patient. What they call Queen Anne sign, which is the loss of the lateral one third of the eyebrows. That is also pathognomonic for hypothyroidism. You can also pick up vitamin B12 and iron deficiencies. Uh, tinnitus or tinnitus um, ringing in the ears um, and what we call uh, and see low amplitude theta and delta waves on EEGs. You can also see elevated liver function tests and uh, hyperhomeocystinemia or high levels of homocysteine and elevated CRP. So those are just a few. Uh, the list is actually longer than that, believe it or not. But uh, you, again, may want to pause the presentation at this time and, and review these again. So there are actually different types of the thyroid hormones. You have the one that's predominant in the production 
at the thyroid gland, which is uh, T4, has four iodine atoms. Uh, it is sometimes referred to as the storage hormone or the pre-hormone because it doesn't have much uh, activity compared to T3. So 80% of the thyroid uh, hormone produced by the gland is usually T4. T3 is missing one iodine atom at a certain location. It is the more bioactive of the hormones listed on this page. 20% of it is produced by the thyroid, but the majority of it is produced in peripheral tissues uh, at the cellular level. So T4 gets converted to T3 by deionizing um, enzymes and it becomes a more active bioactive hormone. Um, it is converted in the liver, the kidneys, muscles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, um, and then affects and attaches to receptors. While T4 does not enter the nucleus of the cell, that's T3 that does. And that's where it enacts uh, messenger RNA and transcription to drive metabolism. When you lose another iodine atom from T3, it becomes T2. And T2 has some activity, uh, but not as much as T3. And we'll talk about why at a cellular level T2 becomes important when it sacrifices an iodine atom to help fight infections. There is a T1 which only has one iodine atom left and it has some questionable activity and then T0 where the molecule has lost all of its iodine atoms for recycling and recirculation. There is something called reverse T3 or RT3. Think of it as the anti-T3. Uh, it has very low activity, if no activity. Uh, they're discovering some other uses and receptors for it. It was initially thought to displace the T3 on the T3 receptor, but there's been no um, published literature to that effect. So we do think now that there are actually reverse T3 receptors on the cell, but they will uh, cause, uh, when they rise in, in concentration in the bloodstream, cause hypothyroidism. Uh, they can have a cooling down response to the T3. So it is important. It, it, uh, it does uh, work in the world, and I use the example of the hibernating bear. So mama bear goes into a cave to hibernate and comes out with cubs in the spring. And so she's not uh, um, all skin and bones. Her reverse T3 wall in hibernation actually escalates pretty high levels. And it tricks the body into thinking that we don't need to make any more TSH and we need to become a little more, um, slow down the metabolism a little bit. Uh, so she doesn't burn off all her fat stores. So when she comes out in the spring, she's, uh, you know, she's alive and can take care of her cubs. And then, of course, you see a precipitous drop in her reverse T3 as T3 climbs. Now, in humans, since we don't hibernate, that's terrible because women will gain a lot of weight, become constipated and hypometabolic. And that's not what we want to see. So it's very important that we check our reverse T3. Deficiencies in zinc, copper, vitamins A, B2, B3, B6, B12, C, magnesium, all are um, causes uh, if when you have deficiency of low production of T4 and also implicated in low production of T4 to T3 conversion. And there's some genetics involved as well, like MTHFR, methylation, and um, uh, hyper homocysteinemia. In this slide, it's just another way of looking at the hormones. Uh, you have mono, di, tri, ido, tyrosine, and uh, thyroxine. That's all T1, T2, T3, or reverse T3, T4, and then I mentioned T0. The uh, free T3 is what we like to measure. It's unbound, so it's not bound to thyroid binding globulins or albumin, and it is a measure of the bioactivity uh, and what's available to the receptors in the bloodstream. Now remember, 
when we take blood from the arm, that's what's floating around in the uh, vein, uh, not at the cellular level. It would be magnificent if we could somehow look at T3 levels at the cellular level or even the nuclear level. Uh, we don't have that technology yet, but that would be the optimum way to manage hypothyroidism. So free T4 is the free form of the storage or pro-hormone. And then you have TSH, which is not a thyroid hormone. It is a, a thyrotropin. It is a anterior pituitary hormone that basically is the cheerleader for the thyroid gland. Uh, and uh, it's it, hopefully it's not a misconception with you all uh, that TSH is a thyroid hormone, as is the TRH, the thyro, uh, thyrotropin releasing hormone, is released by the hypothalamus, and again is a downstream. It releases TSH. So there's kind of this cascade uh, from the higher part of the axis down through the different stages. These two um, images depict the T4 to T3 conversion and uh, with deionizing um, enzymes, D, um, D1 and D2. Uh, so we also can see that D1 and D3 can um, remove a different site iodine atom to make reverse T3. And then both T3 and reverse T3 can then be metabolized further into T2, uh, which has some activity, but again, much, much less than uh, T3. The uh, image on the right shows the axis, the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, and the thyroid gland, uh, which you see the TRH release, which stimulates TSH. TSH then stimulates the thyroid gland to produce T4 which then gets converted to T3, which has a negative feedback on the pituitary gland. Now we'll talk about how that differs in the pituitary with T4 to T3 conversion than it does anywhere else in the body. Let's say the liver, the kidney, or the muscles and bones. And that's a very important thing to understand, that concept of what happens in the pituitary gland with negative feedback is way different than what happens in peripheral tissues. So when we look at me measuring TSH, which is produced by the pituitary gland, it doesn't necessarily give the full picture of what's happening everywhere else in the body. This slide depicts the T4 to T3 conversion. And when we're talking about peripheral tissue or the whole body, D1 is the main enzyme that pulls off an iodine atom. And um, you will see that in the pituitary gland, it's D2, the deionized enzyme sign, uh, signified as 2, that pulls off a different iodine atom. Um, and it works quite differently in the pituitary gland than it does in the rest of the body. But since the rest of the other body cells don't produce TSH, the only feedback we're getting from the blood chemistry tests on a TSH is from the pituitary gland solely. So when that kind of cascade happens there, that's separate from what can be happening, let's say, in your great toe or in your kidneys or liver. Okay, for a minute, we'll talk about the T4 to T3 conversion in a little bit more detail. So there's an enzyme called 5-deodinase, and there are typically three types uh, that have different effects or different concentrations in different organ systems. Type 1, or D1, is located in the thyroid gland, liver, and kidneys predominantly. And it's important in the role in producing the peripheral T3. Type 2, or D2, located mostly in the pituitary gland, the hypothalamus, and brown fat, converts T4 to T3 in those particular glands and tissues. And then there's type 3, or D3, which catalyzes uh, deionization inner ring T4 to T3 to inactivate the hormone. So it takes it from T3 to T2, T1, etc. 
the activity of D2 in the pituitary gland affects TSH levels, and it may be quite different from the activity of D1 in the peripheral tissue. And it's this fact that determines what's the best way or lab to choose to manage a thyroid condition. So you have a patient with hypothyroidism and you want to manage their armor thyroid, let's say. So you don't want to really use or manage with TSH. You'd rather look at free T3, free or total T4 uh, because of the differing concentrations based on the three deionized enzymes. The deionized enzyme has special needs. There are several things that can affect the production of it. Uh, for instance, a selenium deficiency, an iodine deficiency, low iron or low ferritin, a zinc deficiency, and I should say also magnesium is important. Also, lower levels of vitamins A, B2, B6, and B12 can have an untoward effect on the production of this enzyme and also its effectiveness. Heavy metals such as mercury, lead, and cadmium and aluminum can also have a negative effect. Things like famine or starvation or too aggressive and intermittent fasting regimen can also have an effect. It's important to mention that fasting or intermittent fasting can really have a major impact on the function of the thyroid, so be very careful when you recommend that to your patients. Also, over-exercising is another um, thing that can affect thyroid hormones and thyroid function. A high carbohydrate diet is considered a negative. Uh, elevated stress hormones such as cortisol can be suppress suppressing the function of this enzyme. Chronic illness, of course, like diabetes, hypertension, kidney uh, insufficiency, and also acute and chronic stress, like our recent COVID uh, pandemic, can have an impact on people's thyroid function, as well as psychological stressors and inflammation. Inflammation is really key here. Kidney and liver disease is another that can affect this enzyme and the hormones that it governs. With the next few slides, we're going to talk about homeostasis versus allostasis. And we'll also compare the glandular to the cellular effect. There's a big difference, and I usually compare it or make it analogous to a baseball game. So to understand this concept, we need to understand uh, and, un uh, and look at treatment failures. Uh, one out of every three, that's a third, of treated hypothyroid patients still have symptoms. So that's those that have been diagnosed with hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's and are typically being treated with standard therapies such as Synthroid or Teracent or T4 only or inadequate T3, T4 combinations that still have persisting symptoms. When normal serum levels of TSH are achieved, further symptoms are managed to relieve the symptoms. In other words, when a physician will run a test and see that the TSH is between one and let's say three and a half, um, then they're likely to manage the fatigue with stimulants like Vyvanse. Uh, the depression or the sadness or blues uh, are looked at as clinical depression and are managed with a series of antidepressants. And we'll look at how the effects of some of these medications that can further have a negative effect on the thyroid gland. And then the constipation is usually handled by laxatives. Now, if somebody reports fatigue, depression, and constipation, you got to think thyroid first and that the management is inadequate. So there's something called biochemical euthyroidism. In other words, it's lab normal hypothyroidism. Subclinical hypothyroidism, where you have an elevated TSH, mildly, but in normal range T3, T4 levels, 
and this is usually found more commonly in the elderly population. What we need to do is change our mindset. So we have a mindset shift and we have to think of this more as a syndrome than a disorder. And here's the analogy I make with the baseball game. You need all your players in place doing their job to have a successful baseball game. You have the pitcher and you have the catcher. Those are the two key folks. Um, and the pitcher you would think of as the thyroid gland and the catcher would be the downstream uh, cell or the nucleus of the cell and its receptors. There is a sort of the conventional mainstream medicine allopathic view of the thyroid disorder. You have a dysfunctional gland and it's a primary the reason for hypothyroidism. You have a normal TSH, that's the goal, and this will resolve all the issues. If we can get that TSH from 12 down to three, um, and you want to um, discount normal function of the gland with a mitochondrial or cellular stress cause of the disorder. So that's not even considered. Glandular production issue versus cellular forces have to be, you know, have to sh change your way of thinking. Homeostasis actually focused not allostasis, which is cell under stress approach. Uh, too much focus on autoimmune versus the cellular driven regulation on a regional level. It's looked at more as a global level. Ignoring active transport of T3 into the cells and hence then into the nucleus is totally ignored. Um, it's thought of as a kind of passive diffusion and it's not passive diffusion. There are receptors and there are pumps that will pump T3 into the cell and then into the nucleus. And it's thought of as the thyroid gland is in the main control of metabolism versus the cell itself being in the driver's seat. And we'll talk about why that's necessary to have the cell in, in control of its own domain. And as a consequence, T4 only therapy is the standard of care. Why? Because it's long acting. You give it once a day, it has a longer half-life than just T3 or sometimes combination therapies. And it's figured, well, you know, the body will eventually convert T4 to T3. So what you do is you give the pro hormone. Well, we'll find out shortly why that's not always a great idea for most of the patients. So to summarize a little bit, this slide shows the, the organs involved on the left. And it's kind of a linear approach or a linear model that the conventional medical practitioners, whether they be family medicine, internal or endocrine, tend to follow. So the body sends signals to the brain to increase or decrease the thyroid hormone production. And you start at the top with the hypothalamus releasing TRH, which then affects the pituitary to release TSH. TSH is then sort of the cheerleader for the thyroid gland to produce and release T4 and T3. T4 and T3 then uh, travel through the bloodstream and then are diffused into cells. T4 is converted to T3. T3 then binds to nuclear receptors and affects transcription and metabolism. And then you have cellular metabolism at that point. When the cells have sufficient hormones, the process is turned off by a mechanism of negative feedback. So the linear model really um, embraced by conventional medicine to this day, despite an overwhelming ev amount of evidence that shows that that's a kind of very limited or sophomoric view. And again, uh, their focus is really on the pitcher. The pitcher is the thyroid gland, which produces the thyroid hormone or, or the ball in this case, and the catcher is the cell. But the major focus is on 
the pitcher. And with this lecture, we'll actually look at both, but we'll also take a deeper dive into what's going on at home base behind the plate with the catcher, with the cells, and things on a cellular level. So let's take a look at the functional medicine view or the functional medicine approach to managing thyroid disorders. Um, initially, we have to look at the facts that 90% of the destruction of the thyroid gland has to occur before you see a rise in TSH. Let me say that again. 90% of the thyroid gland has to be destroyed or become dysfunctional before we can typically see a rise in TSH. So hypothyroidism may be the body's protection mechanism for controlling metabolism under stress or chronic inflammation or infection conditions. It may be a secondary issue, not primary glandular issue problem. Hypothyroidism may be a state of normal function of the gland, but rather a poor T4 to T3 conversion and a means by which very little T3 is actually entering the cell. So it becomes a cellular focused problem. The cells actually want to control metabolism at the local level. Hence the reason for T4 to T3 conversion in the first place and why only 20% of T3 is generated directly by the thyroid gland. Conversion of the active T3 hormone occurs in organs and at the cellular level with deionized hormones, I'm sorry, enzymes D1, D2, D3. So you want to manage not with TSH and T4. That's a poor way to manage somebody's hypothyroidism once they start medication. You want to seek underlying conditions, cellular and mitochondrial stress, toxicities, and deficiencies. Contemplate this as a syndrome, not as a disease. Think of a rise of RT3, that's reverse T3, as a response to stress. And you will not know this unless you draw for a reverse T3, which is probably one of the most neglected thyroid tests around. Think of resolution of symptoms with T4 only therapy, such as Synthroid or Teracent, as a glandular etiology. So if you can solve the problem with T4 and you have total resolution of symptoms, then you've hit the nail on the head and there's no reason to go any further. And this happens in about 10% of hypothyroid patients. I have nothing against Synthroid. It, it works for many patients. And in some cases, after a kind of a journey through using T3 only or T4, T3 combinations, we find that T4 only is the option that's best suited for the patient. And this is probably because the problem originates at the gland, not in the peripheral tissues. However, we see a lot of T4 only failures and we should view this as a cellular etiology and use different therapies than the standard highly prescribed Synthroid. This diagram is from a 2017 published study uh, looking at thyroid allostasis. And this is actually depicting an image of the antipituitary gland and all the loops, the negative feedback loops, the positive loops, the TRH, TSH signaling and such, and some of the other issues and uh, other things that can affect this on a cellular level high up in the axis. And again, you can pause this presentation to take a closer look at some of this. And um, definitely, if you are interested in reading more, um, actually look up this paper on, uh, online. So hypothyroidism is in general much more seen on a cellular level or it's a cellular event. And there are a lot to human mammalian cells as this image depicts. There's a lot to it and a lot that can go wrong.
So how does a thyroid physiology problem develop? Well, there can be excessive cellular stress. Cell danger response is a term that is used for this. You see a shift from thyroid homeostasis to thyroid allostasis, which is equated to cellular hypothyroidism. So what happens in the pituitary gland may ver be very different from what happens at the cellular level. There's the release of what they call damps and pamps. So damps are damage associated molecular patterns. And that's a condition where you have damage on a cellular level with the release of mitochondrial DNA, or there's a problem with the mitochondria, which activates the innate immune system, which then leads to inflammation whereas PAMPs are pathogen-associated molecular patterns, and that's where you have microbes, viruses, bacteria, parasites that are activated uh, and activate our immune system to lead to inflammation. So that's a whole other hour-long lecture on DAMPs and PAMPs, but these things have been discovered fairly recently and do have a major impact on the cellular level with regards to thyroid. You can also have glandular destruction. So that's kind of the primary glandular issue, which probably accounts for only about 10 to 20% of hypothyroid patients. The thyroid cells perceive a danger signal and the thyroid cells self-destruct and based on the immune system and our immune system that destroys aberrant cells you develop then subclinical hypothyroidism. And then there's glandular exhaustion. An overt glandular hypothyroidism, which is primary hypothyroidism, where the exam just poops out. So we must realize that excessive cellular stress from a multitude of sources is perceived as a threat and you have inflammation and thyroid hormone deactivation as the quote-unquote normal response to this threat. Of course, that doesn't serve us very well, and that's why stress, both physical or emotional, has horrible repercussions on our bodies. So this is a pretty complicated slide, and this comes out of an article from 2017 and I encourage you all to pause this slide and take a good look at this. Um, it'll help put in your mind the process of looking at cellular thyroid allostasis. So you have type one and type two. Type one is basically fetal life when we're, when we're very, very young and born. Things like starvation, excessive exhausting exercise, like running a marathon, depression, and you have type 2 allostasis, which is the pregnancy state, obesity, again, endurance exercise or endurance training, adaption to cold, acute psychosis, and PTSD. There are also drug effects that affect this as well. But please pause this and take a look at the peripheral parts of the slide so you have a better understanding of what can happen during these states with relations to TSH and thyroid hormone levels. So simply put, the glandular hypothyroidism issue is where you have an elevated TSH, a low T4, and of course, one or more of the hypothyroid symptoms that we discussed earlier. And this slide depicts what's going on from the pituitary gland through a description of the hormones traveling through the bloodstream and you end up with certain levels of T3 and reverse T3 and T2. Now, I wish we could measure T2 because that's a downstream uh, hormone of the degradation of T3. And that might be very helpful in managing hypothyroidism, 
but right now it's only used in um, research. It's not clinically available. But should it become, that's something you'd include in your panel and compare T3 to T2 levels. And this will uh, discuss cellular or tissue hypothyroidism. And this is a concept not really embraced by conventional practitioners. And that's why a lot of the hypothyroidism is missed or mismanaged. Here you have the same sort of pattern emanating from the th uh, pituitary gland or the hypothalamus affecting glandular secretions of T3 and T4. And as they enter circulation, they're trying to get into the cell, but there's some sort of disruption. And T3 doesn't get in, or conversion doesn't take place between T4 to T3. You then have a rise in D3 activity and a rise in reverse T3. And that's transported out of the cell into the bloodstream that can be measured. You also have a reduced T3 and you would have an increased T2 response. So with the degradation of T3 to T2, because an iodine atom may be required to protect the cell, and we'll talk about this in a minute, you'll see a rise in T2, which has some activity uh, pertaining to thyroid function, but very little. So in this case, on a cellular level or a tissue level, you'll have a normal TSH and probably a normal T4. So it doesn't meet the medical definition of hypothyroidism by conventional standards, but you have a lot of hypothyroid symptoms and features. So in this kind of heavy slide, we see uh, a lot of things that can affect TSH levels. And you can think of it as a scale or a balance. Uh, but there are certain things that can affect uh, a rise in TSH results, uh, that being obesity, especially morbid obesity, age, female gender, and some electrolyte calcium, um, iodine, and iron uh, variations, dietary so uh, soy. Uh, things like lithium, amiodarone is particularly toxic to the thyroid gland and and other environmental endocrine disruptors. For instance, bisphenol A or BPA is an endocrine disruptor compound or chemical. You have things like metformin, pregnancy, uh, folks of the African American persuasion, and uh, some other things like PPIs, proton pump inhibitors, that can lower the TSH result. So keep this in mind as we're interpreting TSH. So you can also look at hypothyroidism as it pertains to a spectrum from phase zero to phase three. Now, I don't like to necessarily use this with patients because they may not understand that. This is used predominantly when we talk about adrenal fatigue, different phases. But phase zero is basically normal homeostatic thyroid regulation and function. And then phase two, you'll have a little bit of excess cellular stress, which can lead to cellular hypothyroidism. And if allowed to persist, you'll see glandular destruction due to autoimmune immune activation uh, that becomes like Hashimoto's or Graves' disease. And then phase three would be glandular exhaustion. Uh, and then that's tagged as primary hypothyroidism. So this is a rather new concept. This was first conceived or hypothesized back in 2017 in a journal. And uh, it is essentially, um, when I was researching for this particular lecture, something I was unaware of until just recently. And that's the antimicrobial effect of deionase 3 or D3. So one hypothesis explains the role of D3 in microbial killing, that's the killing of viruses and bacteria and parasites, is that the iodine produced or sequestered from the degradation of T3 to T2 
the uh, D3 enzyme is utilized by MPO together to produce hydrogen peroxide and generate hypoiodite or IOH, which is an extremely toxic compound in the cell that is used to kill bacteria. So if the cell is under stress, it's not going to take direction from the thyroid gland because the infection, let's say, is not in the neck or the thyroid. It's actually in your big toe or, you know, uh, cellulitis. So what happens is to fight the bacteria, an iodine atom is, is paired up with peroxide to produce a killing compound to defend the body. And this is at the cost of normal T3 levels on a cellular level. So that cell essentially becomes a little hypothyroid without affecting the rest of the body. It's a very localized reaction. And until that infection is resolved and the bacteria is killed, then the D3 activity diminishes, the job's been done, and the T2 levels go down, the T3 levels go up, and then you have a return to a normal metabolic state within that cell. And you can look at this analogous to this would be uh, like the large federal government, if you're a Hamiltonian versus a Jeffersonian in American politics, where you have the states holding and yielding the power. So big central government versus more states' rights and state management is probably more efficient. Um, and that's how the body did it. The body knows best. It knows how to control its local surroundings. And this paper shines a light on this fact of why that is and how that works. Here is a slide that uh, discusses medication and foods that can become stressors on the thyroid axis and on T4 to T3 conversion. So you may want to pause it here as well and take a good close look and, and commit some of these to memory because they do affect uh, thyroid function. Beta blockers, birth control pills, estrogen, and we're talking not nu nutritional lithium, but the pharmacological high-dose lithium. Phenytoin, theophylline, several of the seizure medications and antidepressants, things like interleukin-6, IL-6, which we are now measuring using Boston Heart and some other labs. And then some of the uh, antipsychotic medications, anti-seizure medications, amiodarone, particularly toxic because it does scavenge um, iodine and has iodine as part of its constituent. You have coenzyme Q10 depleters such as statins. The whole spectrum of the statins are not great for the thyroid. And then foods. So a high intake of cruciferous vegetables or brachis vegetables like broccoli, like cabbage, Brussels sprouts, and I'm talking huge amounts of intake. So people often ask me, well, should I stop eating broccoli? Well, like, no, don't stop eating broccoli. Just don't have a diet too full of broccoli, like breakfast, lunch, and dinner, it, you know, in moderation, all things. Excessive soy intake, also uh, goiterogenic, uh, genistein, as the uh, ingredient in soy that can do that. So again, it's okay to have a little soy milk, but you don't overdo it. Um, low protein diets, low fat diets, and low or high carbohydrate diets, actually. Excessive alcohol use, walnuts, and too much L-carnitine. So we use L-carnitine and frankincense, or Boswellia serrata, to control a hyperactive thyroid gland like you see in Graves' disease as an alternative to um, of chemical agents such as um, those that metamazole that can actually decrease function. And then you have low cysteine uh, levels in the diet. Drugs 
that can affect absorption of T3 and T4. And remember, T3 is much more easily absorbed, maybe four times so than T4. So if you're, if, you know, the, the rule of thumb is that you take your thyroid preparations, I don't care what it is, if it's Synthroid or Armor, on an empty stomach. Empty stomach meaning um, an hour before you eat or two hours after you eat postprandial. Things like ferrous sulfate, iron, sucarifate, sequestrants, like your bile acid sequestrants, lactose, calcium, aluminum, those are things that people ingest and it will sequester or bind and prevent the absorption of T3 and T4. Even caffeine in, in a beverage has deleterious effects. Drugs that can affect clearance are things like your anti-seizure, dilantin, tegretol, phenobarbital. Tamoxifen is another one, rifampin, and uh, some of the anti-virals um, and antidepressants can all have an effect on clearance. Some of these are common sense and some of these are uh, maybe new to you as far as other things that can affect T4 to T3 conversion. Aging, that's kind of an obvious thing. Type 2 diabetes, yeah. The toxins like fluoride and bromide and chloride, all the halogens other than iodine, that's the exception in that line from the periodic table. Things like lead, mercury, pesticides, ionizing radiation, those are all kind of no-brainers because in functional medicine we're aware of those toxicities but also excessive alpha lipoic acid. So prescribing too much ALA can have an untoward effect on T4 to T3 conversion. Things like copper excess, calcium excess, dioxins, polychlorinated biphenols, phthalates in plastics, uh, low DHEA and a cortisol imbalance, whether it's high or low, the stress of surgery, and then there are some other things that can lead to Hashimoto's. Um, and I've listed them here. Uh, some of them are repeated. But uh, PFOS or PFOS is a, a chemical that's also found in like Teflon. It's a fluorinated compound. Fluorine is one of the most toxic substances known to man. Yet we put it in our mouths with in our toothpaste. So I always advocate fluoride free toothpastes and stay away from fluorinated compounds a lot of the antidepressants are fluorinated so it is very toxic to the thyroid it's sequestered in the thyroid and can pickle your thyroid gland re, you know reducing production so these are some things and you can look at some of the genetic things i've mentioned down there hla dr3 comt MTHFR, if you've got variants or SNPs, that can all affect uh, how the T4 is converted to T3. So pause this for a moment, take a look at some of these, um, and commit some of that to memory. The methylation cycle or pathway is another very important process in each and every one of our cells. Um, we were very excited for a while with Benjamin Lynch's work on MTHFR variants, um, but that was a little bit over the top. Probably in the last few years, I've actually stopped testing so heavily for MTHFR and other genomic variants and look at downstream things like homocysteine levels or running methylation pathway panels on patients. And then if you find a problem, you can go back and do the genomic testing. But this is sort of a pretty heavy slide, and if you want to look at some of the things involved in the methylation pathway, feel free to pause this and take a closer look, but I'm going to go ahead and move on. So now we'll move into the effects of the adrenal glands or adrenal dysfunction on hypothyroidism. And again, you've got to get the adrenal glands to work properly. If you don't address them or look into them and you push the thyroid replacement therapy too hard, you'll do a disservice to your patients because you can push that very hard while ignoring adrenal function 
and the adrenals have to be in good working order for the thyroids to work best. Just like when you embark on a functional medicine workup, you kind of address the gut. You got to have a healthy, well-balanced, well-functioning gastrointestinal system for anything else that you may want to um, explore or implement in a patient's workup. So adrenal dysfunction and primary or secondary hypothyroidism go hand in hand. Thyroid antibodies are also seen with adrenal cortex antibodies. Cortisol levels may be elevated to compensate for low T3 levels. So it's good to also check a morning cortisol level or map out the cortisol response with, uh, for instance, ZRT has saliva testing for that. You can also follow the CAR or cortisol awake response mapping where you can do either four or six samples. You take the first sample upon wakening. The second sample of saliva is taken exactly 30 minutes from awakening. And this, these two samples you have uh, a patient take in the bed without even sitting up or anything. It has to be done supine without rising. Um, and that is a very good way to measure cortisol. Measuring a spot check blood or serum level is kind of hit or miss. Um, but mapping out the cortisol function on a curve gives you a lot more information and function about what's going on with the, with the uh, adrenal gland. In previous lectures, I used to focus on the thyroid testing. So for the newbies or the, those new to managing thyroid or those who have been convinced that the conventional system is the only way to do it uh, by looking at TSH and T4, uh, well, I've got some news for you. So besides the basics, the highly sensitive uh, third generation TSH, we're also going to be looking at free T4, free T3, and you can also measure total T4 and total T3. Those are kind of like the basics. And then after that, it opens up to an expanded list. Uh, top of that, as appropriate, should be reverse T3 or RT3. Got to have that to know what's going on on a cellular level. You can also look and should look at thyroid antibodies. Typically, the two most predominant are thyroglobulin antibodies and TPO antibodies. There are also anti-thyroid microsomal antibodies. You have anti-T3 antibodies and T2 levels, which are not clinically available yet, but I'm hoping that that'll happen in the future. And then things like thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins or TSI should be looked at for Graves because you can have Graves on top of Hashi's or vice versa. They're not mutually exclusive. They're both autoimmune diseases, but they can occur together, which makes management miserable. And then there's the thyroid stimulating hormone receptor antibodies. TSHR antibodies can be measured. I don't do that very often, but sometimes I do. You should check iodine levels if you suspect a problem. Most Americans are not iodine deficient. Uh, although if you measure a serum level, most Americans would be based on the reference range. But to truly check at iodine, you want to use urine. Urine is more accurate and gives you a better picture of if there's a deficiency or not. There are iodine tests where they do the iodine patch and rubbing iodine. I don't find that reproducible and it's not a really good test, so don't waste your time with that. You can also look at MTHFR variants, looking for SNPs, uh, 667 or uh, 1298. Uh, you should do both. Homocysteine, I would order that frequently on many of my patients because it gives me an idea. Homocysteine is an inflammatory marker in its own right, but it's also a gauge of how well the methylation pathway is doing without doing a methylation panel. Ferritin, so low ferritin and even high ferritin as an inflammatory marker can look and focus on disease of the liver. RBC magnesium, so you can do a serum magnesium level 
it's not as accurate and it's not a cellular depiction but if you do an RBC red blood cell tag magnesium you get a better idea of what's going on with mag and then a whole host of inflammatory markers you can measure calcitonin and also uh, RBC linked zinc uh, those are just a few of the other expanded lists of things that you want to do. You can check selenium levels too. So we'll move on to things outside of serology or blood testing. And there's more to managing thyroid than just with what you get on a lab panel. And uh, the basics would be basal body temperature. So historically, women would measure their BBT under their arm or under their tongue upon awakening. But a better time to check that would be a single measurement three hours after awakening. Once the body's kind of woken up and the engine's running a bit, then you'll want to check that. Now, temperature does vary with age. As we get older, our temperatures drop. It varies with women's menstrual cycle, and there are other factors as well. Um, but uh, you want to have a goal of 98.6 degrees as the goal for a normal temperature, i.e. normal metabolism. Now, when I brought this uh, subject up, you know, when I spoke with Den Dr. Dennis, um, E. Dennis Wilson, you know, I said, well, you know, there's, you know, the, the, the study of body temperature goes back to a, uh, before 1900 in Germany where, a scientist was measuring uh, body temperatures and determined that the normal was 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. However, um, research after that fact has determined that may not be the normal. And as we get older, the normal will actually drop. So keeping that in mind, you got to pick a number as a goal. And 98.6 has been traditionally the one. So somebody who's 97.2 could mean they're hypothyroid and you can use that as a measure uh, to guide therapy or management. You want to measure this for two weeks and uh, it can, like I say, change with the menstrual cycle. If you want a more expanded or more detailed, you can follow the Wilson protocol and his rule of three. So three measurements are taken each day. The first three hours after you wake up the second would be three hours after the first reading and the third three hours after that. And this is all done by a thermometer. It could be digital or it could be a mercury or alcohol thermometer under the tongue. And then you take all three numbers, add them up, divide by three. In other words, you take the average of the three readings and you plot it on a map or on a graph. And we give out the Wilson graphs to our patients for ease of writing this down. It's better than a patient writing down the numbers and you get this sheet of paper with all these numbers on it. With this graph, it um, projects uh, on a linear fashion on a graphic form so you can follow the ups and downs of the daily temperatures. And you have them do that for two weeks. So again, in modern medical culture, one of the things that our healthcare system lacks is the ability to listen. So some of the other things other than body temperature measurements and lab values is the basics of talking and listening to your patients. Um, so please remember to listen to what your patients say and process that information. Subjective feedback is critical to managing very well, managing the thyroid replacement therapy. Um, you can get subjective feedback and check to see if there are any hypothyroid features. And before you start sending them to the lab for blood work every four to six weeks, you want to make adjustments based on the feedback they give you or the temperature readings. And then um, titrate the dose up or down as appropriate. And then send them out for labs to confirm this in six to eight weeks. Now, it's always good to get confirmation labs. But you don't have to do it with every um, exactly uh, time to every dosage adjustment. You can make an adjustment, wait four weeks to six weeks, get some feedback. If it doesn't seem to be the right adjustment, you move up or down, and then you can get labs in another six or eight weeks. 
uh, there was someone lecturing about uh, thyroid, a very prominent doctor who talks a, a lot about thyroid, and she was always kind of on the defensive or, in, or warning physicians about suppressing TSH. Um, she said, well, you can't defend that before the medical board. Well, are you practicing for the medical board, which is conventional medicine, or are you practicing for your patients? So if you're concerned about a suppressed TSH when your patients feel awesome and other markers like bone turnover markers and such are normal um, and you feel obligated to reduce their dose of thyroid medicine to conform to the guidelines for TSH, you're doing a big disservice to your patient because they'll slip back into hypothyroidism uh, and th hypothyroid features. So if you don't want to have to defend yourself with that, just don't order the TSH. Once the diagnosis is managed with a TSH, uh, you don't have to keep ordering it for management because we know it's not that important. It's the least important blood test. So I will routinely order free T3, total T4, reverse T3, and the antibody titers from time to time, maybe every six months to a year to follow those. So um, if you're overly concerned and want to practice defensive medicine, then probably functional medicine is not for you and you'll need to conform to the practice guidelines currently in place, which is you know 19th and 20th century medicine. But if you want to be on the forefront, then just be smart about what you order and don't order tests that don't really matter. So to recap what I just said, the TSH is not a very good tool for thyroid replacement therapy management. It's good for making a diagnosis of hyper or hypothyroidism. And remember again that D2 activity in the pituitary gland is high. More T3 is generated and that will suppress TSH levels within that negative feedback loop. D1 activity may not be the same in the peripheral tissues. So, you know, we got to look at peripheral tissue. That's how you manage thyroid, not with uh, the pituitary gland. So peripheral T4 to T3 conversion may be lacking on the cellular level, while it may be normal with a normal negative feedback loop in the higher end of the HP axis, H, uh, the uh, hypothalamus and uh, pituitary axis. Therefore, measuring TSH is not a great way to manage thyroid hormone replacement because it is flawed. So again, don't rely or lean too heavily on TSH as it doesn't really reflect peripheral cellular levels. And at the bottom of the slide are a list of things that I repeat, and you can look at the ratios of free T3 to RT3. So once you correct uh, for the conversion of the units, um, you can look at free T3 to RT3 ratio should be 20 or better. Uh, total T3 to RT3 ratios once converted to the proper units uh, should be greater than 10. And then don't forget the subjective feedback from your patients. And because reverse T3 measurements require radioactive isotopes, don't over order those because of its environmental impact. Order them when necessary, but once you've figured out that good T4 to T3 conversion is happening and it's not shunted to reverse, don't keep ordering reverse T3. Once that's figured out, you can order it maybe once a year. This is a slide I've borrowed from doc, one of Dr. Holtorf's lectures, and it looks at reverse T3, free uh, T4, TSH, free T3 levels, and this is all in regards to the severity of a chronic illness, uh, normal aging, um, and things like that. If you look at this bottom scale, you have uh, mild to none to severe, and it affects the levels of those um, tests that we normally measure. So that's a good idea, puts things in perspective here. Again, the landmark JAMA uh, paper 
that was in a 1942 edition of JAMA, of JAMA by Dr. Broda Barnes. It was kind of the first paper to look at optimal body temperature and the measurements of low temperatures suggesting hypothyroidism. So he started this kind of kick on utilizing BBT to manage thyroid. And that baton was picked up by Dr. E. Dennis Wilson and some of the things he's written last 10 to 15 years. You have what was named the uh, Wilson's temperature syndrome um, and uh, it, he uses basal body temperature measurements as well. And he has a protocol for using uh, Cytomel or T3 and also T3 sustained release in a once a day dosing schedule. Now, when you start converting immediate release T3 to um, sustained release or E4M as it's designated in a compounding pharmacy prescription, then you have to add somewhere between 10 and 15%. And you have to make sure the patient has a well functioning gut for best absorption, especially with sustained release formulations. Also realize that brand name Cytomel, uh, at least currently, has gluten in it. So there are a couple of manufacturers that produce a T3 uh, lyothyronine, which is the generic uh, of Cytomel, that is gluten free. So specifically asks, asked for those with your gluten sensitive or, or celiac patients. And we do know that that uh, ingestion of gluten um, and wheat and those sort of things does have an impact on autoimmune and on thyroid function. Again, some things that can lower T3 and increase reverse T3. You have increases in epinephrine and norepinephrine neurotransmitters. Now we have the ability to check uh, urine neurotransmitters. Um, there's newer technology by ZRT that doesn't require a 24-hour urine collection. It's using spot checking throughout the day at certain times to collect that information. But an excess of your catecholamines can affect the thyroid function, and that's related to stress, the fight or flight response. Increase in free radicals or oxidative load, inflammation, aging, fasting. So intermittent fasting is all the rage these days, but you got to be careful. It is not for everybody, so it should not be a sort of knee-jerk reflex to recommend IF for everybody. There is some good data coming out showing that it's very helpful with cardiovascular disease prevention and obesity, type 2 diabetes, etc., but uh, it's not for everybody. It is a stressor. And then you have stress, both physical and emotional or psychological stress. Over aggressive exercise. So your CrossFit boot camps or over exercise syndrome can lead to problems with the thyroid. You see that happening with women who are marathon runners who become amenorrheic. All right. So it hits the thyroid first and then it affects the gonadal hormones. Prolonged or chronic illness. As functional medicine docs, we want to prevent this and then we want to treat it in a more appropriate way. And diabetes. So you have leptin resistance, you have insulin resistance, you have type 3 diabetes that affects the brain. And um, it, this will also include type 1, which is the autoimmune. Heavy metal burdens, mold toxicity, tick-borne disease all have an effect on uh, the T3, as well as elevations in interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, IFN-2. So these are other markers you can look at uh, that could be elevated with low thyroid functioning and increased reverse T3. Again, more markers of inflammation. Inflammation is huge, uh, triggered by stressors. And uh, you can't go too far in treatment without reducing inflammation. Elevations in IL-1, you can measure IL-6, IL-8. 
uh, HSCRP or CRP, tumor necrosis factor alpha, fibrinogen, myeloperoxidase or MPO, LPPLA2 or the plaque test. Um, there are a myriad of inflammatory markers coming out now that are clinically available and we typically measure three to five on everyone in the office. I like this slide. It kind of is concise and puts it all um, in, in on one sheet. Factors that can inhibit T4 to T3 conversion. This is from Dr. Pamela Smith's lecture. So you can pause this and uh, have a, uh, a peek at uh, some of these uh, that can affect conversion. So as far as the halogen column goes in the periodic table, there's only one there that is good. The others are toxic to humans. Uh, iodine is the only good halide and we need to take it in appropriate doses. Bromine, chlorine, fluorine are very toxic. When they got away from iodinizing bread in the baking process, and use bromine, which was less expensive and faster in the bread baking process. They did a great disservice. Uh, also chlorinated water. So your chlorinated pool waters are toxic. What's coming out of your shower head and being absorbed through the skin is toxic. And fluorine. Fluorinated toothpaste, fluorinated products and medications and the fluorinated compounds you see in Teflon and um, flame retardant material and packaging material. They put PFOS in the new um, clamshells now. We're getting away from styrofoam and single-use plastic. So now PFOS is finding its way into your uh, sandwich wrappers and your uh, paper takeout that are coated with this thing. They used to coat it with wax, but now they're using PFOS. And acetonine is a very short acting. It only lasts for a few seconds. It's made in the nucleus of supernovas. It can be made in the laboratory. You're probably not gonna come across it because there's only about 25 pounds of this stuff in the entire planet. Um, it is made in the laboratory because it is a radioactive substance and they're looking at using that to irradiate the thyroid gland because it has a very short half-life. It can kill the cancer cells and then it dissipates. But again, it's in the hal halogen family and it is uh, toxic to the thyroid. So on a positive note, things that can increase or improve the conversion of T4 to T3 are selenium. And remember, when you prescribe selenium to a patient, there is a ceiling, which is about 400 micrograms per day. Make sure that you check and cross-reference all the supplements so that they're not getting redundancy and they can get selenium toxic. You can also get that with certain foods. Brazil nuts tend to be very high in selenium. The average uh, per Brazil, Brazil nut is anywhere between 80 and 100 micrograms. So if somebody's munching on a bunch of Brazil nuts each day and they're eating, uh, and this happened to me with a patient, she was eating about eight a day. So she was selenium toxic and she was losing her hair. So just be aware of that. Also, when you administer iodine, especially if you're wanting to follow Dr. Brownstein's protocols for really high doses, which I don't really endorse but if your patients are doing that make sure they're taking selenium along with it so iodine is a double-edged sword if you take it and your selenium intake is not appropriate because of selenocysteine enzymes that work on this you got to co-administer also the use of potassium iron zinc and magnesium higher protein diets Ashwagandha as an adaptogenic herb, and there are other things too that are helpful with thyroid function. Remember and don't ignore vitamin B, uh, B2, vitamin A and E. Things like growth hormone testosterone can affect the conversion. So can insulin and glucagon. Melatonin, be careful with too much melatonin can cause serotonin to drop. So make sure you're 
aware of that when prescribing high dose melatonin in your anti-cancer or cancer prevention or in long COVID where higher doses of melatonin are advocated. Tyrosine and estrogen in higher dosing can have an effect on the conversion. So sometimes estrogen can diminish whereas progesterone and testosterone can enhance. So be careful with when balancing that. So if you have a patient on thyroid replacement therapy and they want to implement or start using bioidentical hormones for their sex hormones, you got to maintain that balance. So keep checking the thyroids while you're working them up and managing their sex hormone uh, replacement therapy. So again, don't forget about reverse T3. It tells us a lot of information. High normal and elevated reverse T3 and poor free T3 to RT3 ratios are indicative of reduced thyroid transport into the cell. It's also indicative of mitochondrial dysfunction. So proper T3 cannot get into the cells and spark transcription to make things go if you have interfering reverse T3. You can think about it as reverse T3 getting in the way of the T3 going to the receptors. I mean, that's something you can get in your mind about, but in actuality, that probably ha doesn't really happen. There are likely reverse T3 receptors as no evidence has a substantiated the blocking effect of reverse T3. But you can, in your mind, think about that as a way to kind of wrap your head around all this. Disorders of the mitochondria uh, are associated with higher levels of reverse T3. So treat the mitochondrial, give the mitochondrial support. And also gut health. A healthy gut is needed to metabolize thyroid hormones and on conjugation and gluronation and sulfation to excrete all this in the uh, bile. Um, so make sure you got a healthy gut. Um, and remember, 20 to 40% of T4 is eliminated in the stool. Poor gut health will yield poor metabolism of the thyroid hormones. So get the gut in order as you're working up people for their hypothyroidism. So when looking at treating a poor T4 to T3 converter, you can't use Synthroid. If you give them T4 only therapy, uh, you're not gonna solve that problem. I would have to say a good 10% of folks treated with uh, uh, T4 therapy only will do really good, but about 90% of those with hypothyroidism that get Synthroid will have residual symptoms and not be treated optimally. So treatment is multifactorial. Um, you need to look at detoxification, medications and thyroid replacement therapies. You got to look at what you're giving folks and what the co-administration of other medications. Nutrition, of course, plays a big part correcting imbalances and deficiencies in nutrients such as iron, vitamin D, B12, folate. Uh, you need to reduce inflammation. You need to fix intestinal permeability or leaky gut. Um, the T4 has little physiological activity. Most of it is T3. Most patients do better with replacement of T4 and T3 2% of patients will do okay with just T4 only. And um, I find that somewhere between 2 and 10% to be true. T3 is four to five times more potent or stronger than T4 only. No long-term studies have shown T4 only therapy to be effective in treating hypothyroidism yet it is the mainstay of conventional therapy and in the practice guidelines. But no long-term studies have shown it. There's not anything published really. Intracellular thyroid hormone receptors have a high affinity for T3. 
90% of thyroid hormone molecules that bind to receptors are T3 and only 10% are T4. If patients cannot metabolize T4 to T3 and then T3 to T2, then they are not going to be well. The fix really is desiccated thyroid hormone, T3, T4, such as Armour, NP Thyroid, or Nature Throid. Now I can say this because we're not administering CMEs, but if I were, I'd have to take the brand names out. Can't mention them. Um, also, don't forget compounded. So lean on your compounding pharmacy to make a super clean. It can be dairy-free, gluten-free preparation. And you can tweak out and you can use whatever ratios you seem uh, more appropriate for your patient. It doesn't have to be a 4 to 1 ratio all the time. It can be different. And you can control that when you compound. So there are a lot of treatment choices. You can stick with the T4 only, and there are several brands uh, listed there. Uh, T3 alone uh, therapy, uh, Cytomel or Lyothyronine, which you want to seek out the gluten-free type. And if you do do the compounded version of T3, you can make that an immediate release, but be careful because if you dump a lot of that, people can get symptomatic with palpitations and tachycardia. Um, and nervous and anxiety. So you want to put it in a sustained release. Although when you write out a prescription for SR for a compounder, they don't recognize that. It's not typically allowable to use SR. That's something for pharmaceuticals uh, that are produced by Big Pharma. So you have to use the designation E4M as sustained release. That's the designation that uh, is allowed within the compounding pharmacy community to designate sustained release. Then you've got some readily available T4, T3 combinations like Armour, NP Thyroid, West Thyroid, WP Thyroid, etc. You've got bovine, um, and I have some patients that prefer bovine versus porcine uh, thyroid. You've got something that's coming out of, I believe, Australia or New Zealand. Uh, but um, it's so oftentimes on back order or not very readily available called thyroid gold. I had a patient on this and he did extremely well while he was able to source it. Um, you have other things like Thyrolar and Euthyroid, uh, which is typically the 4 to 1 ratio of T4 to T3. But when you compound it, you can use different ratios, 6 to 1, you know, 2 to 1, things like that. And you can adjust up. So if somebody's converting too much T4 to reverse, you can lower the T4 part to keep T4 within range and then increase the T3 component to, um, to lower the sort of uh, reverse T3 production. Now, remember that you basically, the golden rule is you always take thyroid on an empty stomach. There may be one exception as one supplement and I don't really recommend doing this, but I will put some vitamin C in the capsule when I compound for better absorption. So a study came out a number of years ago. Uh, Dr. Hamid at Compounding Pharmacy up in North Carolina told me about the study of an increased absorption of T4 especially, not so much T3, but T4, when in combination with lower doses of vitamin C. That's probably the only known exception to that rule. So on occasion, when I see there's an absorption problem or a problem with the gut, I'll compound a little bit, uh, maybe 30 or even 60 milligrams of C into the uh, compounded T3, T4. Not often, but sometimes I do. Um, but don't advise patients to take a bunch of vitamin C tablets with their thyroid hormone because we don't know what else, what other recipients are in there that can affect absorption or you know, binders or adulterants. So just don't do that. So a little bit about iodine. Uh, there's a big sort of push these days for high, really high doses of iodine as a way to prevent breast cancer 
or uh, treat uh, thyroid disorder. There's some that say, well, if you give enough iodine, you can come off your thyroid medicine. I'm not sure that's the case. Um, I do know there are some little caveats about iodine, and I'll discuss them here. So in um, 1998, the World Health Organization came out with a report that said about 72% of the world's population were affected by iodine deficiencies. Well, if you live in sub-Saharan Africa, and you don't have a lot of seafood intake, and the soil is depleted of iodine, then that's the case. And you'll see that most folks in central sub-Saharan Africa have hypothyroidism. The number one cause is iodine deficiency, but not in the United States or Canada, where we iodinize our salt, and that should be enough to keep you out of trouble as far as deficiencies. But if you wanna take a higher dose for other purposes, um, then you can. Other reasons for iodine deficiency is soil depletion, uh, diets low in seafood and sea vegetables, um, not taking iodinized salt. There's nothing wrong with iodinized salt. So what happens is people start using Himalayan salt or sea salt and that's not been iodinized. So be careful with that. I typically cook with a mixture of your Morton's iodinized salt, and I'll sometimes throw in some Himalayan or some other types of salts. But also be careful with those quote unquote natural salts. They may be uh, laden with heavy metals. So be careful where you source those. And then foods contain bromine. So they brominate bread now, and that can uh, deplete your iodine. Uh, the use of fluorinated compounds. Vegan and vegetarian diets can sometimes be deficient in iodine and the use of sucralose. So stay away from those artificial sweeteners. Besides this problem, they are also neurotoxic. Medications such as Atrovent, uh, Flonase, Flovant, and some other fluorinated drugs can also be a problem. And don't overuse iodine either. Uh, it can result in uh, thy thyroiditis, especially if someone has Hashimoto's. Uh, when you replace iodine, replace it with iodine and iodide. Use a combo. And also, don't forget about selenium. As I mentioned earlier, it should be co-administered. You want to also look at mitochondrial support with magnesium, glycinate, and a CoQ10, and ALA, but not too much ALA, D-ribose, NADH and L-carnitine. Again, not too much L-carnitine because it can suppress thyroid function. You want a little bit. And you may want to check somebody for TMAO because if they have a high level of TMAO, which is can be um, toxic to the cardiovascular system, then you don't want to uh, recommend too much L-carnitine because that feeds the fire. And um, uh, also red meat, you have to be careful with that consumption. Iron, if ferritin is less than 100 nanograms per ml in the serum, and also remember zinc. So some nutritional support I put patients on. So if they're not quite ready for TRT therapy um, and a prescription for armor, then you can support the thyroid gland with some of the following here. So vitamin C, um, and vitamin D are important. Uh, vitamin B2 or riboflavin uh, is a cofactor with selenium. You have iodine and iodide can be found in kelp or bladder whack. Uh, these are supplements. Uh, there are some patented supplements that have a combination of these. Don't forget magnesium. Don't forget zinc. Please don't forget selenium. But there is a ceiling on that, uh, no more than 400 micrograms per day. L-tyrosine, which is the building block of the thyroid hormone molecule. Ashwagandha. Ashwagandha is really a good adaptogen. Dose it at night because it can cause sleepiness. It is in the uh, family of um, nightshades. So if somebody has a nightshade issue, um, you may want to have that consideration although I think that's uh, kind of blown out of proportion for most people. 
Uh, but yeah, so that is um, in many formulations. You can give it as a standalone or in combination with some others, like a thyroid support formula. Uh, for scolin, uh, Google, and curcumina or curcumina longa or turmeric or curcumin, I like to use Cure Pro BCM95 if I'm using that particular intervention. So these are considerations, nutritional support for the thyroid, whether they're on thyroid replacement therapy or not. I sometimes rehabilitate it by using a combination patent um, for about two to three months. I would encourage you all to uh, take a good look at this chart. This is a conversion chart and maybe even print it and have it um, um, available to you for quick reference, but it's a conversion table. I think this is from the makers of Nature Throid, um, and they compare their products, Nature Throid and WP Thyroid, to Armor, NP Thyroid, Synthetic T4, which is Levothyroxine, and Synthetic T3, Cytomel, or Lyothyronine. So you can look at, for instance, one grain, that's the old terminology. Don't write that on a prescription, it might be confused with one milligram, we kind of got away from that terminology, but one grain is equivalent to 65 milligrams of um, nature throid and armor. And that's also equivalent to um, armor 60 milligrams. So one grain is one grain, but when we talk about nature throid or WP thyroid, we're talking about 65 milligrams. When we talk about armor or NP thyroid, we're talking 60. Again, it's the same dose, but it's designated differently. That's equivalent to about 100 micrograms of T4, if T4 is working well by itself. Um, and also that's equivalent to about 25 micrograms of T3. So you can make those kind of conversions if need be. So if you need some supporting documentation or information or published uh, papers in peer-reviewed journals uh, to support the fact that you're not going to be using TSH alone uh, to manage thyroid replacement therapy, uh, then this article in the Journal of Orthomolecular Medicine from 2013 can back you up on that. So that might be something for you to read. So when uh, one does not uh, particularly like natural desiccated thyroid preparations that are commercially available, you want to look at compounding or slow release or immediate release. But either way, there are a few little rules to follow. For those that need T3 only therapy, those not responding to T4 or T4, T3 therapy combinations, you uh, can prescribe Cytomel, that's commercially available for immediate release, or it's generics, which you can find some that are um, gluten-free, let's say. But for those who don't even tolerate that, it doesn't work for them, then you need to consider uh, T3 therapy alone compounded, either sustained release or immediate release. But remember, sustained release is better tolerated. You want to visit your local compounding pharmacy for help. I make it a point of visiting all the compounding pharmacies that I use. I like to take a tour and see uh, you know, how they run their operation, how clean their rooms are, and if they have the appropriate equipment. So it's a little bit tricky and it's more uh, of a skill and art than a science in some cases. And when we're dealing with microgram doses, it's very important that they have the right equipment. So there's one particular pharmacy that I use up in North Carolina uh, that has a V blender or V mixer, which is, um, photo, there's a photograph of what one of those looks like. That piece of equipment is about the size of a standard microwave oven and it costs about $20,000. So if the pharmacy is not doing a lot of sustained release compounding of thyroid hormones, they're not going to invest in this machine and they'll do it by old fashioned mortar and pestle, which is just inadequate. Uh, so make sure that those prescriptions go to a compounding pharmacy that has a V blender and they know how to do it and use it. 
and uh, encourage your patients to stick with a particular pharmacy. Switching pharmacies with compounded medications will be a roller coaster ride for many of them. So when you get a good compounding pharmacy, encourage your patient not to be too, you know, price shopping for the best deal. Um, it, it may not serve them well doing that. Stick with what works. So of course, all of the clinical practitioners are um, of the culture or the mindset of EBM, evidence-based medicine. So here I've put a few things in here and I have a whole lot of references at the end of this lecture for you to peruse. And um, everything in this lecture is substantiated and backed up by evidence-based. You have to be selective because for every trial that says one thing, there's a clinical um, trial uh, published in another peer review uh, journal that says the opposite. So you got to kind of look at the subjects, um, the publications out there and, and pick wisely. So in this one study um, by Actis um, back in uh, 2020, so it's a recent study, a uh, total of 130 patients diagnosed with autoimmune thyroid hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's uh, were studied and found that um, it commonly had uh, a commonality of a D and a B12 deficiency. Um, a literature search was done regarding iodine, selenium, vitamin D, and gluten in patients with Hashimoto's. And this is from a study from 2017. And it showed that there is a suggestion that gluten uh, may be a problem with patients with Hashimoto's. So try to get them in on a gluten-free diet. Um, it also suggested that uh, iodine, selenium, and vitamin D deficiencies um, were also exacerbating the condition. I'll briefly talk about LDN, low-dose naltrexone. But again, that is like a full hour-long lecture um, and since this, at this time, um, I've been talking for about an hour and 52 minutes, so I can't spend another hour talking about LDN, but it's worth mentioning here. So LDN is great intervention for folks with autoimmune disease. And since Hashimoto's is an autoimmune disease, we can start treatment uh, on a course of LDN, but there are some caveats. You've got to, um, start low and go slow, even really super low doses like 0.25 milligrams starting off. Uh, if you start off too high, folks can have an increase in their TPO antibody titers. So again, take it gentle. Make sure you do a lot of patient education with LDN with your patients before starting this therapy and go over the pros and cons. Uh, make sure you're taking patients off of gluten because if you're starting LDN and they're already on gluten and haven't removed it from their diet, then you're kind of chasing your tail. Um, make sure you test their GI tract. Make sure they have a healthy gut. Now, LDN will heal uh, leaky gut, but you also need a healthy gut to uh, best absorb LDN. And that's really all I'm going to say about that. Again, check out my other lectures on LDN for more information on that intervention for a wide variety of conditions. So again, I can't really talk too much more about LDN, but um, uh, the, we are members of the LDN Research Trust. I do sit on their medical advisory board, and uh, there's some great things. So stay tuned for the next lecture on LDN. Um, and um, it's used in Hashimoto's, it's used in Graves, it's used in almost every autoimmune disorder, all 120 of them. Uh, it's used in cancer prevention and treatments and immunological disorders or immunodeficiency syndromes, um, things like what uh, Lyme disease can cause. So it's used in that patient population as well. So as I'm getting to the end of this lecture, and thanks for bearing with me for these two hours, hopefully you guys took breaks in between, some take-home pearls. Um, make sure you check the adrenals before pushing the thyroid replacement therapy too hard. Uh, more fatigue as TRT doses increase, where sometimes people will get better with an increase for about two weeks and then they'll crash again. 
that usually indicates adrenal dysfunction. So don't ignore that. Make sure you're also checking BBTs, basal body temperature measurements, and ordering the appropriate laboratories. Listen and talk to your patients. Uh, remember also magnesium can play a nice role in patients if they're having racing hearts or irregular rhythms because of thyroid replacement therapy. Make sure there's not a magnesium deficiency. And also don't forget to heal their gut and don't forget to measure RT3, but don't over measure it or overuse it for environmental concerns, but make sure you're on top of the conversion and the ratios. So a book on hypothyroidism that probably all of my clinicians should um, be reading um, is how to diagnose and manage hypothyroidism in the 21st century. This is the second book of a series, uh, Stop the Thyroid Madness, book number two. It was published in uh, 2000, the end of 2014 by uh, Janie Bothorpe. And actually I did uh, chapter three on NDT, but there are about 12 or 13 chapters in there. Adrenals are uh, discussed as our MTHFR and methylation pathway, uh, along with a lot of other good uh, data from clinicians, MDs, NDs, PhDs have all contributed to this um, book. So it's a good read. And the next few slides will be all the references and acknowledgements. Um, so please uh, take a gander at some of this. This backs up all the uh, slides in this presentation. So thank you for listening in on this presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Remember, you can go back and pause through the uh, presentation to kind of dive into those slides a little bit more. Uh, we do offer hormone replacement therapy sub-internships at the Priority Health Academy. It's usually a six-month course. We do uh, offer BHRT shadowing and preceptorships in the clinical offices. Um, as part of the curriculum, uh, we do a six-month um, shadowing and lecture series. And if you're interested in that, uh, please contact me on my email address or visit salibi.net or call my clinical office 800-965-8482 for further information on how you can um, do a internship at one of our centers. And again, thank you so much for um, listening to this uh, lecture. I hope you got a lot out of it. And of course, we want to thank the pigs for providing us um, some of the original hormone replacement therapy for our patients.